Welcome to the latest Evershed Sutherland Legal Insights podcast. Hello and welcome to our inaugural EU AI Act Legal Insights podcast, a series with various experts, various slants and topics. In this podcast, we will be looking closely at the EU AI Act, how it impacts you and its effect globally. My name is Caroline Sullivan. I'm a senior associate at Evershed Sutherland in our data protection and cybersecurity team based in London. And I am joined by Yannick Donneman, our senior associate based in Munich, and David Wilkinson, our intellectual property partner in London. Today, we will be discussing the EU AI Act and its impact on IP rights, issues around training data and the risk of IP infringements when using AI solutions, and what litigation we are seeing in this area. Yannick, I know there is a lot of discussion on IP in the context of the AI Act. What does the Act actually say on IP? Uh, thanks, Karen. That's a, that's a very good question. And I think if you're if you're following the media, then then you would assume that the AI Act says a lot on IP because I mean IP is very essential for creating AI. But the truth is that it doesn't really say much on on IP. So there's no really resolution on any of the issues like training data or output content, whether whether that should be protected or not. The AI Act is very silent on most of these issues. So um, there's a lot of controversy around that, whether the AI Act should say something on these issues. But seeing that the AI Act is very controversial already and, and the governments are pretty much at their throats on, on, uh, on the, at the negotiating table, um, I wouldn't expect to have any, any IP involvement in the current version. So in the next couple of days, we will likely see how the AI Act is going to be passed and if it's going to be passed. Um, but I think any any modernization, any changes in the IP section would likely be resolved by other legislative piece and not the AI Act. David, there has been a lot of controversy and lobbying around whether the sources of data used to train AI systems should have to be disclosed. Why is this issue important? Uh, thanks, Caroline. Well, uh, to answer that question, I'd like to go r- right back to first principles, if I may. And for an AI system to work properly, it's got to be trained. And the way that happens is by pushing large quantities of so-called training data through the system so that it learns how to do its job. So if we think for a moment about where that training data could in principle come from, it may, of course, be expressly licensed, in which case it's low risk. It's a low risk activity. But a lot of training data is not licensed. Um, it comes from data mining, publicly available material on the Internet. And that category of data definitely carries a lot more legal risk. There's three risks in particular, copyright infringement, which we'll say more about in a moment. Here in the UK and in the EU, there's a risk of database right infringement. Um, And thirdly, there's also a potential risk of breach of contract because many websites contain terms and conditions which uh, prohibit uh, data scraping and the use of uh, material on the website for uh, commercial purposes. So there are real... Uh, legal risks. But one of the issues that claimants have when trying to uh, tackle those kind of risks is to prove that, in fact, their data was used to train the system. And that difficulty of proof is a particular issue in jurisdictions, uh, civil law jurisdictions such as France, Germany and so on, which do not have disclosure as a standard part of their litigation process. Here in the UK and in the US, we at least have disclosures. There is a way of getting underneath the skin of what's happening. Um, So the reason it's important, it's rather a long-winded answer, is that if there is transparency, transparency around the source of the data, Um, it's likely to assist claimants in bringing claims where they believe that their copyright or other IP protected material um, has been used without their permission for training purposes. And David, post-Brexit, the UK is not bound by the EU AI Act. 
what is the UK's approach to AI regulation likely to be? Well, I would draw a, a distinction between UK government policy and what's likely to happen in reality. Uh, so far as the policy is concerned, the UK government takes what it calls a pro-innovation approach based around five principles. And those principles are safety, transparency, fairness, accountability and contestability. No actual legislation is proposed, at least not to begin with. And instead, those principles are going to be um, enforced on a uh, or implemented rather by existing regulators. So we'll have to see uh, how realistic that policy is and how it's implemented in practice. But I think the reality is that for most providers of AI systems, they will be heavily influenced by EU regulation and also US regulation. To use uh, GDPR as an example, that has in practice become the, the gold standard for data privacy um, re regulation. And certainly I think the EU's intention is that uh, it, its uh, regulatory interventions become widely adopted even outside the, uh, outside the ambit of the EU. And we're already starting to see litigation in the US and the UK around training data. What are the key issues to be resolved in those cases? So uh, we are indeed seeing litigation both in the US and in the UK. I'm not going to say a great deal about the US, but uh, since I'm not a US qualified lawyer, but just you know, looking at the, the the press coverage, you can see that there are a number of um, actions that have already been brought by authors and others asserting that the use of copyright material to train AI systems amounts to an infringement. And one of the key issues to be resolved in those litigations is whether the US fair use doctrine will provide a defence to copyright infringement. Here in the UK, we have one case that's working its way through the system. That's Getty Images Against Stability AI. It's been very closely watched. Getty Images claims that more than 12 million of its copyright images were used without Getty's permission to train the AI system. And they've sued for copyright infringement, database right infringement, trademark infringement, and passing off. The, the latest news on the claim is that there was a uh, strikeout or summary judgment application by uh, the defendant, uh, which was heard uh, in early November. And the, the grounds for the strikeout were, first of all, that the English court does not have jurisdiction because the training actually took place in the US or Germany. And, and secondly, that the particulars of claim don't even disclose an arguable cause of action. So um, it's very much watch this space um, as far as that case is concerned. Um, but whatever the outcome, there will be others coming down the track. That, that's something I'm sure of. And Yannick, would you expect that in Europe as well? Um, right now, I think I would not expect that to have such a huge impact in Europe as well, because uh, one thing I think where uh, where Brexit already took effect to a certain degree is that uh, that the EU in 2019 passed the digital single market and amending directives. So in short, the DSM directive and they in, in that directive, they reformed certain aspects of copyright law. And there's a provision that that generally allows text and data mining, which is essentially the underlying technology for AI training as well. And so that exception allows relatively broadly uh, all these practices of gathering data and using it to to detect underlying trends and, and, and mechanisms behind it. So I think the main, main opinion of most researchers on the topic is right now that most of the AI training is actually covered by that text and data mining exceptions. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that when the EU Commission drafted that proposal, they were not really thinking about AI. They were thinking about big data strategies and stuff like that. So the things that we have been talking about the last 10 years, but they weren't really thinking about AI, but essentially when confronted with uh, the fact that this is now being applied in the AI sector, then, then I think most of them realize that it's 
it actually fits the AI use case very narrowly. The question is whether there's any political will to, to change that in the future. But uh, given the, this, uh, the legal setting right now, I, I would expect that most of the AI model providers would claim that they fall under that exemption. And of course, there's always the chance that the courts may de decide differently. Uh, there's always arguments about that, but, uh, but based on this right now, I would not expect that to change anytime soon. And David, where does the UK stand on an exception for text and data mining? Well, we do have an exception to copyright for text and data mining, but crucially, it's only for non-commercial purposes. Uh, the UK government consulted on a wider exception, which would cover commercial text and data mining, but that proposal was withdrawn in March this year essentially in the face of opposition from rights owners. There are also, just in terms of exceptions, um, very specific defences to copyright infringement uh, covering, for example, criticism, review and uh, news reporting. But unlike the US, we do not have a an overarching uh, fair use doctrine. So my view really is that the exceptions are likely to be of fairly limited relevance, both as regards copyright infringement and also database right infringement. Thinking about output data, Yannick, how do those issues around training data affect the use of these AI solutions? I think that the effect is rather indirect and it's, it's important to note the difference that uh, these AI models, or at least most AI models, the way they are designed is not a huge uh, model accessing data from a database, but that the the models are rather rather constructed to read in the data, learn from the data, and then not touch the data again. So the the, the models rather learn from the data and uh, and gain structure and complexity from it without really saving and storing the data. So I think in general, the models are not constructed to, to contain the data. So the, the question of what is comes out of the model and what is uh, the use of the model is very different from the training process. So all I, I would say that most of the legal, legal debate around training data is more focused on the AI providers rather than the AI users when they're, when they're in actual use. Where the user, of course, comes into play is if something is generated that is identical or very similar to, to the training data and that's, uh, and that's covered by any IP right, then of course it, it would be a question of whether that constitutes uh, an IP infringement. Also in, in the European Union, even if there's text data mining exceptions for this output content, it's very questionable whether whether that would also be protected under any tax and data mining exemption for the for the training part. And David, some providers of AI systems have started to offer their customers indemnities to cover IP infringement. What's the significance of that? Well, I think it's a commercial response to customer concerns about being potentially dragged into copyright infringement litigation if they start to, to use uh, generative AI systems. And platform providers are keen to remove that concern by offering an indemnity. And we're now seeing several providers who take that approach. Obviously, as with any indemnity, it's important to read the small print and take note of exactly what it does and doesn't cover. But I think there's no doubt that indemnity is likely to be welcomed by clients in those kind of circumstances. And Yannick, do you have insights on that from your experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that we we don't really see these copyright infringement litigations in Europe right now, and it's a question of whether we will we will ever see that on a broader scale. So I think it's the model providers actually take a um, take a calculated risk probably on that, and of course, as as they control the technical infrastructure of the models. They also have the means to, to, to a certain degree, at least, control what comes out of it. So uh, I think all of the large model providers actually have technical measures in place that are supposed to limit and mitigate the risks of any, any potential output risks on their side. So I think that it's, it's a big mixed batch of calculated risks and a lot of technical ingenuity to protect from these uh, cases ever realizing. And clients are also often inquiring about the protection of output content. 
How is AI output treated in IP legislation? Well, I think that that's a difficult topic that everybody is still trying to figure out in their jurisdiction. I think for EU uh, copyright law, at least, the, the narrative is relatively clear, stating that uh, AI-generated content is not subject to copyright protection because the EU copyright has this underlying idea of a human author that expresses itself in its works, and that's why the, the work is essentially de deserving of protection. But uh, for computer-generated work, uh, this, this philosophical idea doesn't really apply. I would always draw a difference between AI-generated works that are completely automated and AI-assisted AI works. So um, it is a difference whether, whether I, as a user, really design an image and, and calculate some, some generated aspects of it. So if I rather to use the AI as a, as a brush for my painting, then, uh, then having basically all of the image painted by my AI for me. So um, I think that is a, an important distinction, but I think case law still has to develop on where the exact boundary lies in those cases. And David, what's the UK's position on copyright protection for computer-generated works? Well, unlike most other countries, the UK's Copyright Act expressly provides for copyright protection for computer-generated works that don't have a uh, human creator. And wh when this uh, was first proposed back way back in 1987, the protection was said by Lord Young, who was one of Mrs Thatcher's ministers, to be the first copyright legislation anywhere in the world which attempts to deal specifically with the advent of artificial intelligence. So for once at least, I think the British government was probably very well ahead of its time um, when it uh, thought to introduce that measure uh, back in um, 87. There was a consultation uh, in 2022 on whether to change the law on computer generated works given the, the the rise of ai and the risks which are sometimes um, associated with it but the government decided not to change anything at least for now and uh, they they are they are currently in wait and see mode thank you so much both for joining us we regularly publish thought leadership so please log on to evershedsutherland.com to read this Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and look out for our next episode in the next few weeks. Thank you for listening to the Evershed Sutherland Legal Insights podcast. 